And is me holding the phone hey. this way good? Oh, sorry. Hey, everybody. It's Craig Sarkees from Walk in Faith. Thank you, Kenny Woodsonowski. He was interrupting my intro, but that's okay. Kenny and I go back a long way. He is a coordinator for the youth ministry in the Brooklyn Diocese. He also teaches. He's a wonderful man, if we're not familiar with, with Kenny. Kenny, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do for the diocese? Uh, I have the pleasure of being coordinator youth ministry for three parishes in the Diocese of Brooklyn. I've been working in these parishes along with about 10 others over the last 15 years, uh, coordinating youth programs for young people. Of course, uh, it's different these days than it used to be, for sure. But I mean, I had a chance to run retreats, leadership training, uh, service programs, weekly youth groups, youth centers for young people from middle school straight through college. Wow, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't even recite all that. I mean, I know <laughs> you uh, for, uh, I don't know, maybe 15 years, something like that. I went to World Youth Day with you several times, which is where I, I sort of got the introduction to the diocese and I reconnected with my faith, I think, like most people. And, and, and you also teach. I mean, you have, uh, your resume has got to be about 10 pages. You also do a daily news report, which I always find to be fascinating. When I want to find out about the news or the weather, I, I follow Kenny on his social media. Um, so now let, let me, let's talk here for one of the things that, you know, what is, I'm a little concerned about, but I'm also intrigued and interested is that I see a lot of, let's say youth kids, I don't know what generation we are now, Z, Y, but I see a lot of youth on social media using it for what I like to say, the real intentions, which the communication, but it's, it's not about, you know, materialistic things. It's more about their faith through prayer, family, friends. So I don't know if you've noticed that. Have you noticed that social media lately has been used in a different way opposed to what it was a month ago? Oh, for sure, definitely. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see how many churches, first of all, there's a lot more out there than even before. Of course, the live format also has blown up between daily liturgies, uh, you know, Divine Mercy Chaplet, different youth ministers collaborating together you know, music, prayer, reflection, questions together. So first, there's a lot more out there in the last month. And it seems like every day there's something new. Uh, I mean, I even did a three-day retreat with a Salesian priest, Father Steve Ryan, which was amazing three days. And that was a whole different venue that he's never done before. I've never actually experienced before. And there were literally thousands of all age people, you know, family, young people, adults, having a chance to share in their faith. Uh, on the other side, I guess, yeah, likewise, seeing young people, since they can't come, they've been used to in our programs coming at least two or three nights a week to connect, to be together. And now they're looking for other ways of doing that. And I think they've likewise turned to social media, whether it's, you know, us posting a song or us putting out there, you know, some uh, video chat that they've become a part of. And they're looking for ways to connect Mm. Where before, these devices were more of a way that they disconnected, mm. you know, which is ironic that the use has changed where before they used to withdraw by looking at their phones. Now they're actually looking at their phones to see somebody and to talk to someone. That's, I like that. I didn't think of it that way. You're right. They would use a phone to disconnect. And now, they, like you said, they're really connecting. I mean, I, I, I received so many text message emails from people that I didn't even know had any spiritual religious background. Hey, let's pray together. Or, you know, I don't like the whole post this 10 time thing, but I'm getting, <laughs> yeah, I get my mother sends them to me. One was an Easter egg. I'm like, ma, stop sending them to me, but whatever. I, I don't, I don't feel guilty if I don't repost them, but it, I feel like it's really being used, like you said, to connect. And I don't know, I, I don't, I'm trying to figure out why. Is it because we're all going through this global pandemic? Is it because of fear? Is it because everyone is doing it. Why do you think there's such an increase now of people wanting to rediscover or share their faith? Well, one is if we think about it, I mean, in New York, we've already been sort of living this for five, six weeks. You know, this wasn't just a, I mean, a lot of people compared us to 9-11, 9-11 traumatic lingered but it was a one-day event mm -hmm. this has literally uh been weeks months in fact recently talking about spiritual stuff you know someone sent something talking about you know we're approaching the 40 days wow. and talking about you know how 40 is such a magical number in our church and really there's some psychological and spiritual connection with that that to really change you, something has to be longer lasting because we all know we have those moments where like, ah, you know, I'm going to go to church this week or I'm going to, you know, go on a diet this week. And you got to get past almost a certain amount of time before you can change your habits, change the way you see things. And in some ways, I mean, I think we've been in this so long. And of course we constantly don't know 
how much longer where I think people really have nothing else to turn to. And I've also maybe broken down some of the walls over these last couple of weeks to sort of become more open to, you know, spiritual things. And I don't know about you, but I've questioned the more, my, more, my uh, mortality, you know, just how delicate and how, uh, how short life really is. Because I mean, I don't know about you, but every day you hear of someone else, oh, yeah. you know, has died. And I think it's really, waking up a lot of people to say, wait a minute, what, what is life about? And they're asking those existential, deeper questions of their existence. And yeah. if this is it, you know, what was my life about? Or what do I want my life to be about uh, moving forward? I, I, I think I, I totally agree with you. It definitely, I think it's put a lot in perspective. And I always love the question, who am I, right? And, it, and I, you know, it's an easy question. If you think about it, it's actually really difficult. And most people say, yo, I'm a plumber, I'm an electrician, but that's not the question. I think what this has done is stripped away everything that we thought and we idled and we said this was important. You know, we have such busy lives and we have never have time for our families, but now we have the time. So we're sort of exposed to reevaluate our choices and say, am I really happy? Is this really what I want to do? Is this really what I was called to do? And you see that it's really, it's like an awakening. And I think you're right. The 40 days, you, you, you need to do this. If it would have been a week or two weeks, I think people would have went back to their old habits. But I think because it's so long, you know, I think people will change and at least will rethink and evaluate what's important. What now, you know, you said about the 40 days. Now you have these kids that come every week, every day. They rely on this as a place, as a safe place where they get away from you know, adversity at home or aggression or the build community, whatever the reason is, how are you communicating with them? Well, it's definitely been a challenge. I mean, I'll be honest with you. It's very difficult, especially our ministry, ironically, this year was blowing up. Like we had crazy amounts of numbers of kids. And really the challenge when they were in our presence was how do you build a relationship with a hundred plus kids? So that challenge has now been multiplied with likewise, if we were having difficulty relating to them in person, now we don't have that person to person thing. So one thing that we tried to do was, you know, unfortunately I have a lot of help and volunteers in our ministry. I mean, literally we gave lists of, you know, 20 kids, their parents' numbers and the kids' numbers. And literally they, you know, day by day tried to call and make that initial voice connection. And uh, the amazing thing was, I mean, it's a little thing like that in and of itself that someone's like, Hey, how you doing? What's going on? And, you know, I'm here to listen was probably the most impacting thing that maybe we've even done so far. Um, likewise, we have these weekly chats that we're meeting with certain people that, you know, have taken a greater role in our ministry. One, trying to pray together, trying to reflect together. The same thing too. We always start off, you know, which is people sharing where they're at because one it is amazing that everybody in some way is going through the same thing, which really has never happened before in our country, in our world, that we're all sort of in that same place of uncertainty, fear, death, um, you know, being sort of isolated. Uh, so, so that actually has become a, a thing that I think that has helped us help people stay connected more because everyone, even if they're the ones just listening they can understand what the other person's trying to share. You're, you're right. I think this has definitely united us all, and we've been able to see past these average and these small differences that we would, you know, really harp on. What, what? Out of curiosity, when you talk to some of these kids, what is? Have they? Do they are they open about sharing? Do they all have share a similar, you know, issue or concern? Are they open or they say, ah, this is nothing? Or do they? They are they honest and say, I'm afraid. You know, I've lost someone. I don't know how to handle this. I don't feel comfortable going to my parents. Like if parents are out there and, and their kids are locking themselves in the room, you know, and, and they, they might be afraid, you know, and then how do you have that conversation with them? What has been some of the common fears or anxieties that they've dealt with and how do you, how do you handle? Uh, I lost you a little bit, but I think I have to hold on. So Kenny, as I was saying. So I, I'd say, first of all, there's, even though we're all in the same experience, every kid is processing it differently. Um, some are, you know, seem like in denial. Some kids, maybe it's really not affecting them. Uh, but for those that seem like they're a little, you know, struggling, uh, lost the words, of course, yes, especially kids that are dealing with sick parents 
we're dealing, you know, obviously the grandparents have been a big hit with a lot of the young people, uh, with people being sick, dying, or even just the, the, the fear. Uh, I can even speak of just my own kids. I mean, my, my oldest son, you know, he's just afraid of what could happen to grandpa or grandma, you know, if they were to get sick or could he bring something to them. So there's that fear and anxiety. Then on the other side, my other son, you know, sort of shut down a little bit. And of course, one level gave him some space. Second was, hey, constantly reminding him, I'm here to talk, but also them putting out there saying, hey, if for some reason you can't talk to me, uh, you know, whether it's aunts or uncles, guidance counselors, even uh, one of my sons, they said, hey, our priest gave his cell phone number out. Um, and ironically, my second oldest son actually called his guidance counselor and had a chance to talk and vent. Mm-hmm. It's really important to, I'd say, give them space, but also let them know that when they're ready or they have to talk or at least opening up the possibility that they could talk to somebody else. Um, I mean, even, even, even New York city is offering a wonderful service, you know, through three one one where literally people can call and talk to a counselor because definitely the anxiety I'd say our younger generation was an anxious generation before this. So on some kids, it's like skyrocket of just anxiety, stress, fear, um, and likewise, giving them opportunities to vent it out. In our group chats, I mean, older kids maybe can verbalize it, but the younger kids more, I think they find it hard still too to talk with their peers about, you know, what they're feeling and thinking. What are, what are some of the signs? If, um, you know, my son's only four, so he's, doesn't, he just sees the masks and he doesn't fully understand it, so we have appropriate conversations. But what are some of the signs that you would, you know, if, if it's a kid, does he, is he not motivated? Is he shut down? Like, what are some of the signs that parents can look for? Well, one, so we don't panic. I think every one of us sometime in the day normally should probably have a moment where like, oh, my God, you know, like you might have a moment of being overwhelmed, maybe even get emotional and cry, uh, you know, need to be alone, maybe even have your outburst. And I think, one, that's a normal thing. And I would hope that if we're really dealing with this, those, those things are going to happen to us as adults and they're going to happen to the kids. The problem would be then if it's prolonged, like, you know, like if it's the entire day that now, you know, they're staying in their room or, you know, they seem to be volatile all the time or or even just the fact that, you know, they're not doing their work, they're not responding, they're not communicating. I know something that's helped in my house and it seems to help in some other families is trying to create a few routines, you know, so of course, a beauty of this has been, I mean, I can't tell you the last time I ate dinner as an entire family, you know, seven weeks in a row. I don't think it's ever happened until the last <laughs> seven weeks. But that's important to, to make that a routine. And even at the dinner table, we make a chance for each person to talk a little bit about their day, about school, about how they're feeling. Uh, likewise, we try to, make a, try to make a family activity, something you're going to do together. Because the other problem here is, uh, teens and young people naturally, naturally, even before this want, you know, I want to go gaming. I want to go, you know, unplug. And that's still okay. And in fact, they, they probably enjoy that more because that's the one time they get to talk to their friends. But trying to make sure you try to do something together as a family, you know, whether it's playing a card game, watching a movie, mm-hmm. uh, you know, baking, those things I think are healthy and helpful. Now, of course, if you, if, your kids don't want to do that. I mean, it's okay, but if they, if a week goes by and they're sort of once again totally withdrawn, then that could be a, a warning sign too to look for. That's interesting. I, I I love the fact about it's sort of going back to the basics. I made a joke. You know, my parents would say the good old days, the good old days, and in a sense, the good old days were like sitting on the stoop, watching a movie, baking as a family, doing arts and crafts, the things that we no longer do as a family. So I I love that you said that. Um. So now, I mean, like you said, it's difficult as an adult. Like I know I have a family of bills, where you know all these anxieties, but we have to sort of you know be the rock. What do you lean on during this time that sort of keeps you connected to your faith, that sort of keeps you, you know, that lessens the anxiety and the fear? Because it's easy to be filled with fear and anxiety during these times. Oh, yeah. And I've been there, and I'm pretty sure anyone watching this has been there and may be there right now. Um, I mean, personally, one, I I have to begin my day in prayer. So, I mean, that's how I have to begin it. And, And whether it's reading scripture, whether it's taking a quiet walk 
and praying, you know, a mantra, praying the rosary, praying the divine chaplet. That's something that one, I have to begin my day with before I, you know, take care of any of the kids, try to take care of, you know, any of the, the demands of life and being at home. And, and another beauty of this has been, I mean, I'm, I'm now attending mass every day, uh, which of course, realistically, it would be difficult to, difficult physically but the fact that now you talked about starting from the beginning social media i mean i could watch a live mass pretty much any time of the day or of course if it's live it's still what you can watch it four hours later uh and still be a part of that mass so i mean daily mass has been crucial for me um and then likewise making sure connecting with you know hopefully other mentors other family members that can help ho hopefully hold you up I mean, a nice part has been, you know, between my brothers and sisters, some of the other people that work in youth ministry, uh, even priests, friends of mine, you know, if you have a chance to interact with them, maybe one day they're lifting you up, the next day you're lifting them up. I think it helps a lot that you, no one person feels like they got to be the rock all the time because this is, I mean, you're, we're in this for the long haul, um, you know, um, and that's helped me where I haven't had to be the rock all the time. In fact, I've even told my wife, hey, <laughs> I need a day where I could just be, you know, maybe a little bit, you know, withdrawn or, hey, excuse me on my moodiness. But, you know, likewise, I'm just trying to get through, get through a moment. Um, and, and it helps if you, if you can have someone else to balance that responsibility uh, too. Yeah, I agree. It definitely does. I go for my walks in the morning and I, and I think it's, it's, it's really important. You know, if the one thing people walk away with after this is really to get a routine, like I have a routine too, go for a walk in the gym, I listen to podcasts, you know, always listen to preachers, pastors every day. And that, that sort of sets the direction of my day. I pray daily devotionals, like, and then the day starts. I don't let the day control me. So let's just say for kids out there, young adults that whether they have a relationship with Christ or not, what are some of the things they could do over the next few weeks to build a relationship with Christ? And so let me ask, if someone's out there saying, you know what, God would not accept me. I am a sinner. What would you say to them? You know, that's always the question. Now, if I go into church, this will happen to the church. What do we know about our faith? Well, it's funny. I, my mind was going in one direction. And then when he said the latter part, it's like, I'd rather start there, you know, There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing, nothing. Um, and that's the first thing that I think a lot of people forget. Uh, the only thing that separates you from the love of God is yourself. And unfortunately, if people get past that one thing, uh, it could change their life. And then, of course, second is, you know, there's nothing you can do. Nothing you can actually do to be loved more or less by God. So if we accept that beautiful grace and gift that we have and then acknowledge the fact that God is still co-creating with us today, uh, even in the chaos, uh, in the good and the bad things, likewise, it changes how you view yourself, you view the world, you view other people. And with that said, I mean, literally, uh, it just takes an openness and and. It's, it's different for every person. I mean, I wish I could say, hey, if you pray the rosary or, you know, if you, you open up the Bible. But the key is, I guess, especially for young adults and adults, you got to put away what has happened in the past, too. Like maybe said, ah, that didn't work for me or, or that, that didn't say anything to me or I didn't like that. Or maybe you had a bad experience with something go back with it with an openness and you might be amazed how God now will speak to you in a different way, you know, through scripture, through prayer. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we're made in the likeness and image of God, but there's something unique about you. So the other thing too, is it's gotta be real for you. Like, is there something that you're passionate about? Or is there something that connects with you? I mean, like my daughter's a wonderful artist. And really, I look at her artwork as some, even though she's not drawing pictures of Jesus, I mean, pictures of flowers, it just becomes spiritual. And mm -hmm. likewise, if you could see that everything is sacred, everything. See, that's the other thing too that for me has helped me in this corona thing that is everything's sacred. You know, even things that suck are sacred. <laughs> um, like this corona thing is sacred. Um, 
And if you could start to see everything in a sacredness, I mean, likewise, whether you're a big exercise buff or you're a big writer or reader, uh, you could take those things and once again, let God speak to you through those things that make them sacred. And, and once you find sacredness in one thing, I would hope eventually you, you re start realizing it's everywhere. Um, I mean, I've had this mantra, you know, um, meus deus et omnia, God and everything, uh, that there's nothing, nothing that's, nothing's not sacred. And I think too, like one for me, one thing that struck me is, you know, the church, I, I can't wait to go back to the physical church, the building and be in the body of Christ with people physically. But I think most of us have started to see, wow, the church is not just the building. The church is not just the priest, not just the being together in that sacred space. Every space is sacred. Uh, you know, whether you're in your basement, you're right now in your bedroom, uh, whether you're walking on the beach, whether you like, and I think hopefully that sacredness, if we could start to once again, uh, start to see it everywhere then and then it just changes the way you look at yourself and everyone else i love that and i, I love that too I, i've heard it also that the church is not the four walls you know we always spoke about bringing the church to the people and especially in like different areas like williamsburg it's difficult and, and this is the perfect opportunity to actually bring the body of christ bring the church to the people in a very unique way kenny I really appreciate your time. You know, I'm going to pray for you, pray for me. And, you know, do you have any resources or if there's anything out there or any websites, if, if a family member or a young adult or maybe a parent wants to, you know, find some more information about youth ministry or about scripture, can you recommend anything? Uh, well, anything of Bishop Barron I love because he, he's one of those guys that just speaks so eloquently but down to earth. So you look up Bishop Robert Barron. Uh, Father Richard Rohr and the Center of Action and Prayer. I uh, know Action and Contemplation, uh, CAC.org. I mean, it puts out great things, thoughts, things to read. Uh, I've been enjoying the uh, Steve Agrisano. He does the Divine Mercy Chaplet every day at three o'clock on Facebook. Powerful man, song, prayer, reflection. And lastly, I mean, I would, I would jump on, uh, you know, the Salesians up at the Marion Shrine. They have uh, DMACT Ministries. I mean, they're, put, they're doing a daily streaming of mass. They're also doing other Q and A's. And on Saturdays, like really gear it to younger people. You know, Father Steve pulls out a puppet, you know, recognizing, hey, they're kids, social media. You gotta, you know, um, and, and really just literally there's so much out there. It's uh, spend some time, you know, instead of playing Candy Crush or, you know, <laughs> looking at, uh, you know, some other things really, it's just amazing. I mean, even there's a new, a new online show coming out called The Chosen. That I yeah, it's actually out. out. Yeah, I'm familiar with that show. You can watch it on YouTube. Um, a fantastic show. I mean, fantastic show. Kenny, it's always a pleasure. God bless you and your family. Um, you know, I'll see you on Facebook. Let me know what the weather forecast is tomorrow. Definitely. I can go outside. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Walk in Faith. Always remember, you have the ability to inspire and evangelize your words and actions. God bless, Kenny. God bless, Craig.